Pink Floyd's 1973 album, The Dark Side of the Moon, remains one of the most iconic and popular releases in rock music history. Back in the year when people still went to record stores to buy vinyl, rather than just pulling up Spotify on their phone, Dark Side of the Moon was the equivalent of a blockbuster. It was certified platinum 14 times in the UK and charted on Billboard in the US for a total of 962 weeks. But just what goes into making a recording that's so timeless that it's still being discussed nearly 50 years after it was initially released on an unsuspecting public? Today, we're looking back on the making of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. But first, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and leave a comment letting us know what other landmark albums you'd like to hear more about. Okay, we'll see you on the dark side of the moon. With global sales of over 45 million copies, Dark Side of the Moon will likely stand for all time as one of the most commercially successful albums ever made. At the time Dark Side was made, many rock artists, perhaps following in the footsteps of the ever-inventive Beatles, produced record albums that were meant to be heard from start to finish, connected by a unifying musical or lyrical theme. Albums were meant to take the listener on a musical journey, not simply be a vehicle for the next top 40 hit single. Despite that trend, Dark Side of the Moon was still something of a bold sonic experiment. It was bassist and songwriter Roger Waters who first proposed that Pink Floyd make a concept album in the aftermath of the release of the group's LP Metal in 1971. The band was feeling exhausted after extensive touring in the UK, Japan, and the US, and felt strained and disillusioned by the rock and roll lifestyle. Waters was also in a reflective mood during this time due to the deteriorating mental condition of his friend, founding Pink Floyd member Sid Barrett. In late 1968, the group had decided to start recording and performing shows without Barrett, whose behavior had become increasingly erratic, partly as a result of heavy psychedelic drug use, and not the fun kind of erratic. Many of the ideas for Dark Side of the Moon, particularly the album's fascination with disillusionment and madness, were direct reactions to Barrett's personal decline. Waters explained that the song Brain Damage, which contains the album's titular lyric, I'll See You on the Dark Side of the Moon, was meant as a message to his old friend, letting Barrett know that he wasn't all alone in the universe. Barrett walked away from the music industry and public life altogether in 1972, but continued to inspire the members of Pink Floyd, and Waters in particular. Both the 1975 song collection Shine On You Crazy Diamond and the 1979 rock opera The Wall also contain tributes and homages to his deranged genius. The entire band liked Waters' idea for a concept album and began pulling together and writing new material in late 1971 and early 1972. They landed on Dark Side of the Moon as a title for the album early on in the process, but considered changing it after discovering that it had already been used by another band, Medicine Head. You remember that classic album by Medicine Head? For a time, the album was alternately known as Eclipse, or Dark Side of the Moon, A Piece for Assorted Lunatics. Hard to believe that one didn't stick. Ultimately, the band decided to go with the original title, and if anyone got confused, well, it was on them. The album was produced in London between May 1972 and February 1973 at the legendary EMI Studios, which have since been renamed Abbey Road Studios after both its location and the other very famous album that was recorded there. That one with those four guys crossing the street? In terms of the album's overall sound and particularly its audio experimentation, Dark Side of the Moon built on the band's previous work throughout the 1970s. Engineer Alan Parsons had worked with Pink Floyd on their 1970 album, Adam Hart Mother, as well as The Beatles on Abbey Road and Let It Be. Parsons made use of some studio techniques he'd employed on those projects, such as 16-track mixes that allowed for greater flexibility and a wider sonic palette than previously looped recordings, and the use of then-cutting-edge analog synthesizers. Ultimately, Parsons had a falling out with members of the band over his subsequent profit participation from the album, or lack thereof. Parsons didn't get any production credit on Dark Side and thus failed to cash in on its legendary reputation and runaway success. However, he did go on to find success with his own band, The Alan Parsons Project. One of the album's signatures is the inclusion of brief, sometimes difficult to discern snippets of interviews with Pink Floyd's 70s road crew and staff. During the recording sessions, Waters had the idea to interview people around the studio using note cards with philosophical or personal questions written on them ranging from, what's your favorite color, to when was the last time you were violent? 
which is a heck of a question to ask the guy whose only previous duty was to lug around the drum kit. One especially notable interview with Rody Roger, the Hat Manifold, provided some of the most memorable snatches of Dark Side dialogue. It was Manifold who recalled getting into a violent road rage incident in which he gave another driver a quick, short, sharp shock. He's also the guy who describes his personal philosophy as live for today, gone tomorrow. Among the many brief bits of dialogue on Dark Side of the Moon, you can actually hear a snippet of the Beatles song Ticket to Ride. Producers were recording their interview with the doorman at EMI, a guy named Gary O'Driscoll, who was explaining, there is no dark side of the moon, really. Matter of fact, it's all dark. The only thing that makes it look light is the sun. As he talks, an instrumental version of Ticket to Ride can be heard playing faintly in the background. And speaking of the Beatles, producers also grabbed some snippets of audio from Paul McCartney himself, who just happened to be around Abbey Road Studios during the dark side production process. During McCartney's interview segment, Waters recalled that the Beatle performed a little music of his own, which unfortunately made the recording unusable. Ultimately, Sir Paul did not make it onto the final album. Another notable background role on the album went to Peter Watts, Pink Floyd's former tour manager and the father of actress Naomi Watts. He can be heard laughing on two different songs, Brain Damage and Speak to Me, while his second wife, Patricia Putty Watts, speaks the line about the geezer who's cruising for a bruising. That plays between the songs Money and Us and Them. Watts is also featured in the album art from Pink Floyd's Amagama. Session singer and songwriter Claire Torrey, a regular performer at Abbey Road Studios, was brought in to work on the track The Great Gig in the Sky and received extremely vague instructions from the band. There were no lyrics for her segment of the song, and Pink Floyd guitarist and vocalist David Gilmore, who was running the session, was apparently struggling to even describe to Tori what he wanted her to sing. Tori essentially improvised the vocals that are heard on the album. At first she thought she'd messed it all up until she saw the band's enthusiastic response. Despite the breadth of her contribution to the track, Tori received her usual 30 pound session fee, the equivalent of about 420 pounds or about $500 today. In 2004, she sued the band and EMI for 50% of the songwriting royalties, arguing that she had basically co-written the song that day in the studio, which technically she had. The case was settled out of court, and though the terms were never disclosed, Tori was likely compensated to the tune of several million dollars. It was, in fact, a really big album. And speaking of money, the very famous intro to the Dark Side of the Moon song of the same name features the sounds of cash registers and clanging change. Most of these recordings were actually made in the homes of the band members. In his memoir, drummer Nick Mason recalls drilling holes in old pennies, threading them onto strings, and then swinging them around to create some of the sound effects. Others were created by swirling coins around in mixing bowls and various pieces of pottery. As the band was producing these increasingly complex songs and soundscapes, they were also trying to figure out how to incorporate them all into their live performances. Their successful run of touring behind metal had culminated in a four-night run at the Rainbow Theatre in London, during which the band debuted the Dark Side song Eclipse, while noting its added technical demands. Already, these Rainbow Theatre shows demonstrated the increasing size and spectacle of a Pink Floyd performance, requiring nine tons of on-stage equipment, which a team of four roadies required six hours to assemble. The intensity of the Dark Side sound collages required even more powerful and elaborate sound and lighting rigs, and more innovations around staging and spectacle in the years to come. Work continued on the music at Abbey Road Studios through February 1, 1973, and by March 17th of that year, the album was in stores in the U.S. Four days later, it had hit number one on the U.S. Billboard chart and was the number two most popular album in the U.K. Money became the band's first charting single since 1967 and Pink Floyd's first top 20 hit song in the States. Not bad for their eighth studio album. Ultimately, the album was so successful, the band was able to use part of the proceeds to enter the film business. When members of the beloved British comedy troupe Monty Python failed to raise sufficient capital for their film, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, a number of musical artists, including Led Zeppelin, Elton John, and members of Pink Floyd, ponied up some of the cash. Python member and director Terry Gilliam suggested that the rock stars might have thought of the film investment as nothing but a tax write-off, but the movie ended up being a financial success and an enduring classic. You and all your silly English knickets. The iconic Dark Side album artwork, featuring light being reflected through a prism, was produced by the English art design group Hypnosis. You know, like the thing magicians do but not spelled the same? 
along with artist George Hardy. Hypnosis had worked on several other Pink Floyd projects, including the covers for the albums Adam Heart Mother and Obscured by Clouds. For Darkseid, the band asked Hypnosis to design something smarter, neater, and more classy than their previous concepts. And now that album artwork is a perpetual fixture on college dorm room walls around the world. This also marked the first time the band printed all of the lyrics on the album sleeve, an indication of their belief in the lyric significance. And of course, we can't speak about the ongoing legacy of Dark Side of the Moon without talking about The Wizard of Oz. The Dark Side of the Rainbow theory holds that the film and the album sync up perfectly together if you start them at exactly the right moment, which they kind of do, sort of, although you have to connect most of the dots yourself. The theory has been around since at least the 1980s, but was popularized by a Fort Wayne Journal Gazette article published by Charlie Savage in 1995. But Pink Floyd has repeatedly denied any intentional effort to line up their songs with the movie. David Gilmour dismissed Savage as some guy with too much time on his hands. And Nick Mason told MTV that the theory was absolute nonsense in 1997, joking that the album's actually based on the sound of music. If we could have written the sound of music, we probably would have done, but we didn't and couldn't. And so this was the way it turned out. No word, though, on how it might match up with Cats. So what do you think? Which behind-the-scenes story about Pink Floyd's iconic Dark Side of the Moon album surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.